This morning, I'm going to talk to you about the most excellent way. Then I'm going to talk to you about the new covenant. Jesus' purpose was to bring forth the new covenant, the new agreement, the new way in which God and man can be together. God is a fellowship. There is fellowship at the heart of the universe between the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. For eons and eons of incalculable amounts of time, they've always treated each other well. They've always been kind to each other. They've always been unselfish and honoring and loving and benevolent and good. It is the basis of morality is the basis of unity and harmony. It's the basis of love and unselfishness. It's the basis of all relationship. God himself. And out of that love and fellowship, life emanated and life created. God did not need man. He was never lonely. He was never lacking. He never needed anything. But out of his exuberant love, he created. He blessed. And he created man in his likeness and image. According and like. Basically, God created man to share in that fellowship, in that relationship. This was the purpose. It was a relationship all along. Fellowship all along. Then we get to the tragic event, what theologians call the fall. I like to call the rebellion. Because a fall somewhat sounds like a tragic accident, but a rebellion is a deliberate choice to make war again. And so we have taught the story of the garden time and time again. So I won't belabor the point. But I want us to understand that from the very beginning, it was a breach in intimacy. Remember, Adam walked with God in the coolness of the garden. He had fellowship. But after the selfish choice of Adam and Eve, where they chose their own personal happiness... Over the happiness of God, there was separation. There was estrangement. So if today we're going to talk about the most excellent way. We're going to talk about the new covenant. We're going to talk about how the blood of Jesus fixes this problem. But remember, it primarily is a moral problem. A problem of fellowship. A problem of estrangement in relationship. Now I want to say very quickly at the beginning. That when it comes to the atonement of Jesus. I think it must be studied with absolute humility. I see so many High-minded theologians think that they have an absolute grasp on what Jesus did in his accomplishment. I believe we can be certain of certain facts in what he did, but I think that the correct the correct heart and mind approaching the atonement is that of humility and worship rather than a comprehensive understanding. Because I promise you, if you look at how Paul describes it, it's like it's progressively unveiling in its wonder. If if someone understood it, you would think it would be Paul, and yet he progresses and and God forbid that I should boast in anything except the cross of Christ by which I am crucified unto the world. 
and the world is crucified unto me. Then he begins to say, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. I was persuaded to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. For I preach Christ crucified. That he tasted death for every man. That he desires all men to be saved. You see, Paul in his understanding of the crucifixion is always more. He eventually says that God has brought all things near through the blood of the cross. This is the excellent way. Now, this, this is not teaching universalism. But it's showing you the magnitude and the scope of the atonement. And I see so many theologians say it just means this. And I don't see that in the early church. I don't see that in the early church. In fact, the early church had 10 different motifs of understanding the atonement. A wonderful book that I recommend on studying those motifs is written by a Mennonite named John Driver. And he does a very thorough work on understanding the atonement. Because he makes the argument that when the church understands the atonement in a greater capacity, it affects its mission. And so he wrote a book called Understanding the Atonement for the Mission of the Church, and in which he studies the ten views of the atonement by the early church. He covers the different views, the, the victor view, the redemption view, the martyr view. It's a wonderful, wonderful book that I really recommend. But in reference to the atonement, I just want us to be worshipers. When, in, in reference to what Jesus did on the cross, it should always inspire us to worship. So let's throw out some of the I think common words that are associated in what Jesus did. You ever heard of the word atonement? So when we talk about atonement, I love what E. Stanley Jones says. He says, at one meant that God and man would be at one again, that there could be unity and harmony and fellowship again. That the estrangement of relationship can be re reconciled, you know. Many of you have committed yourself to the ministry of reconciliation. reconciliation. And so apart from the atonement of Jesus, there's no reconciliation. And so now I like to ask a lot of questions about the atonement. And the reason I ask those questions is because I believe what Jesus did on a cross is strong enough to handle those questions. And always be careful if you're in a religious environment that shuns questions. That, that's very dangerous. If you're ever in a place where, oh, you can't ask that or you can't think that, that's dangerous. That's when the name tags come out. <laughs> because what Jesus did on a cross... Theologians have been discussing and sometimes even arguing for thousands of years. But I want to come back to some basic primers and filters. What does the Bible say? What does, how does this relate to fellowship? How does this relate to holiness? Some people don't think that their view of the atonement affects the way that they live. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. There's an entire motif of the atonement that the atonement is the basis for us to change the way that we live. That, it ha that they talk about the moral influence of the atonement. That what Jesus did on a cross was to be the shock value that would change us. And they talk about uh, people who hold that view They use a, a phrase that you probably don't hear it very often. It's the phrase, darling. 
Any of your dads ever, ladies, ever, da, your dad ever call you darling? Mm-hmm. Anybody know what a darling is? Mm-hmm. It's a baby lamb. Mm-hmm. And the Jews, before Yom Kippur, would bring in a darling into their household. It would become like a family pet. Like there's Lammy. Mm-hmm. You know, you see the little kids riding Lammy. See Liam playing, pulling on Lammy's ears and making it a little necklace and feeding it carrots. And that's the, that's, where are you taking Lammy, Daddy? That, so your eyebrows go up. I saw half these ladies' eyebrows go up because what, what's happened? You're like, oh no, that's the whole point. The shock value. So people would understand that there would be this barbaric contrast of white wool and rich, rich red blood. Have you ever been in a situ- situation where it's like, there's blood, where, where's this blood? It shocks everyone, stops everything. Everything stops. People now have this awareness that something has happened. It's significant. And that's the whole point. There was supposed to have a moral influence of the atonement. Understand me right now. Heaven was making captivity captive. All the gods of the heathens, they required what? Sacrifice. Appease the heavens. Appease the gods. You give your offerings. Give your animals. Offer your children some in some barbaric cases. But this is the first time. See how this is a reversal? Rather than giving to heaven, heaven gave to us. It's a cosmic reversal. It's, it's going the other way. We're always trying to appease the heaven. Heaven is offering a sacrifice on behalf of man, not man offering a sacrifice on behalf of heaven. See, this is what Peter talks about, the restitution of all things. It's basically like, if you could imagine, a march of people going to perdition. It was this event, which was so cataclysmic, that it basically turned the people marching the other direction. Think of it that way, like you have an entire group of people marching one way and now they're completely marching. They're being persuaded and beckoned through this one event to march the other way. It's the, that's what we call the moral influence of the atonement. And it's right there in the scriptures. Jesus is crucified on the cross. And who was the closest to it? The centurion, a Roman, an outsider. And what was the centurion's statement? Surely this is the Son of God. An outsider. That's the moral influence of the atonement. That that shock value. It would have been in everyone's heart. All of his disciples would have had the same mentality. Not Jesus. Not the best of us. Not the best of us. I never really understood this. Until I was with a group of men. And they were being foolish and stupid. And then the authorities came. And then one guy was like, oh yeah, I did it. Even though he wasn't even there and didn't even do it. He's like, I did. Because he didn't want those other men to face the rep- Face the consequence. It's very much like that. He who did no wrong. Stepped in. That's, and so that's our next word. So we have atonement written down. The next word is substitution. Substitution. I believe in a substitutionary atonement. That Jesus substituted himself. 
But very important distinction. And we don't have to get into the particular. But I believe Jesus substituted himself for the penalty of sin. And that's a very important theological distinction, which we don't really have to talk about, but we could if you're interested in it. But, so I have to ask yourself, I have to ask you guys, what's the penalty of sin? Uh-huh. Something coming. And after the judgment. Death. Death. More than death. The death actually goes there. Death is cast into the lake of fire. Hell is cast into the lake. Of... That's the end of the story for sinners. Right? Now, excuse my frankness, but... Did Jesus, was he in hellfire? Real crickets in here, huh? The answer is no. So you have to understand that if he didn't go through hellfire, then what he did was a substitute for the penalty. A substitution for the penalty of sin. In which the relational issues and the legal issues could both be wisely solved. So what were the relational issues that sin causes? You've already said separation, estrangement, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, resent. All of these issues that come up with people's sin. So those are the relational issues. What would be the legal issues that come up with sin? Okay, well, I'm just thinking, how many of you have roommates? A lot of you. Yeah, okay. What if you had a one roommate who just kept sinning against everyone in the house? Kept eating all their food. Kept turning the thermostat up and down. All the stuff that y'all argue about all the time. Always left dirty dishes out. Always parked their car sideways. Like what else do y'all squawk about? All, I mean, what can you? So that just there's relationship issues. What I'm talking about is there's relational issues that the atonement solves, but there's also legal issues. Basically, if sin isn't stopped, it leads to more sin, and it leads to worse sin, and there begins to be ramifications that affect society. For instance, if if a judge doesn't enforce the law, what happens? People will do what? If, if there were no speeding tickets, people would go fa- would it drive whatever they want. So in the same way, the atonement has to fix the relational problems and it has to fix the governmental and legal problems. So you have to ask, is what... Is what Jesus did on the cross of Christ a sufficient solution to both the the relational and the legal problems? I believe it is. Because the power of the atonement, I don't want to get too technical. The power of the atonement turns sinners into sons. It solves The two great problems, it provides cleansing and it also gives creation. We would agree that it's through the blood that we're born again. It's through what Jesus did that we're regenerated and that we have life again. Restoration, regeneration, renewal, revival, rebirth. And so it it solves the estrangement problem. It solves the relational problem, but it also, it creates an individual who no longer wants to do what? Who no longer wants to break the law. 
who no, who no longer wants to break fellowship. So you see how what Jesus did was a substitute to solve both the relational and the legal problems. Because it regenerates the individual. And they don't want to break the law anymore. They have a new heart and a new mind. And, and it completely can solve the problem. But I also want you to be aware that so many people have faulty religious concepts regarding the atonement. And a lot of it, unfortunately, comes through our songs, through our hymns. A lot of the languages of our songs and hymns, although beautiful, and wonderful imagery actually doesn't accurately describe what Jesus did. So if I said Jesus paid our... Okay. All of you said debts. That's because that's what a song says. Actually, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says he forgave our debts and paid our... Ransom, very important distinction. See how those songs had led you astray from a biblical perspective? And so just write that down. Jesus forgave our debts and paid our ransom. Very important distinction there. So But once again, I don't want us to get too technical and lose the spirit of worship associated with what he has done. Because when you look at the end, in Revelation in the fifth chapter, it says that there's people from every tribe, tongue, and nation there. And what are they doing? Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, he has prevailed. And they're worshiping him. They're worshiping him. Because he has prevailed to lose the seals. So I never want us to lose that. And I never want us to get too technical. And lose the whole purpose of the atonement. Which is relationship. And regeneration. So write that down. Relationship. And regeneration. The purpose of the whole gospel was to bring many sons to glory. New birth. So this is a really fun one and it creates all kinds of questions, which is okay. Remember, questions are okay. And so you have to ask yourself, and it's a great question. Are you ready? Why can't God just forgive? What does God expect of us? Friar, you sinned against me. I'm going to require a sacrifice. So you have to ask, was the sacrifice for God's sake or for ours? Now, theologians will debate this. Even great friends, people I love, have different views about this. And that's okay. But I just want to propose the question. Was the cross for your sake or for God's sake? A dear friend who says, God, God saves us from God for God. Good friend. What do you think? Have you ever thought about it? Now, I think everyone's in agreement that blood was needed. And what's the verse for that? Without the... Shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So everyone believes that it's needed, but you have to ask yourself why. And I want us to, I want us to think of it this way. One of the main reasons that blood was needed is for cleansing. For cleansing. First John tells us. Anyone got it? 
God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the what? And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness, all sin. Now that word there, cleansing, is in the continuous tense. That means it's actively cleansing. It's continuously cleansing. Think windshield wipers. It's cleansing. And that is how the Bible can say in Hebrews that he has perfected forever all of them that are sanctified by him. And that he is a great general assembly of the firstborn. There's all kinds of angels, it says in Hebrews. And then there are the spirits of just men made perfect, the Bible says. And it's through the blood. So it's through the blood that we have right relationship. It's through the blood of Jesus that we have right standing. It's through the blood of Jesus that we have cleansing. It's through the blood that we also have ransom. Now you have to ask yourself, ransom from who? And that is a, a question that I'm still actively studying. But I find it because if you take what's called the Christus Victor view of the atonement, which is very popular in uh, Jesuit circles and Catholic circles. And, and before you think Catholic, uh, you know, you think Mexican Catholic with Mother Mary. No, you got to think thousand years earlier, you know, when there was one church and all the theologians were Catholic at that time. You have to understand, it wasn't what it is now, a thousand years ago. But, but the Christus Victor view of the atonement, which is one of the views that Driver mentions in his book, he talks about how that Christ liberated us from the enemy and delivered us from the powers of darkness and made a public spectacle of them. He, he, that's what Paul says. Paul says that what Jesus did, he made a public spectacle of the enemy. He, he, he disarmed them. He declawed them. He took captivity captive. So that's this ransom from the enemy. He, he, he purchased them and freed them. That's one of the, the motifs of the atonement was liberation from the powers of darkness and Satan. But the other side, they, they want to push back on that. And they go, no, Satan's not that powerful. Satan didn't have that much uh, authority over man. And that's where the conversation is still in debate. And what I'm doing, hopefully, is just giving you some windows into where to study insights to give. By no means is this lecture a, you must believe this. What I want to do is show you the manifold wisdom of God. And when I say manifold... How many of you ever watched Bob Ross? You know, big hair with the brushes, happy little tree. Well, the word for manifold is what Bob Ross has in his hand, that palette. All the different shades, you know, you have you know, white, cobalt blue, and titaniums, and all that. All, what do you, you those, yeah, all those crazy colors, and he mixes it. That's what I'm showing you. The atonement of Jesus Christ is very much the manifold wisdom of God. It has all of these incredible parts to it. And so be very reluctant to be, I am a light pink guy. I'm light pink. It's only light pink. You need to understand that the moment you become to understanding regarding the atonement, there's something you don't understand. You're, you're, we're just paddling on the edge of the ocean of understanding what God did to reconcile the world to himself. How he disarmed principalities and how he, he brought liberation. And how there's freedom and cleansing and restoration and ransom. And that there's healing. There's healing through the atonement. And it's incredible. So rather than always try to understand, we should always pause and worship. So we talked about cleansing. We talked about atonement. We now let's talk about the word, very, very long word, propitiation. It's not used often in the Bible. Remember, anytime, anytime not, things not used 
often in the Bible, you should pay attention. But he is the propitiation for our sins. And not just our sins, the sins of the whole world. And before anybody says, oh, Jesus laid his life down for the sheep and only the sheep. Understand this. Jesus tasted death for every man. Every man. The Bible is categorically clear. Whosoever will, let him come. It's one of the last verses in the Bible. The Spirit says in the last verse of the Bible, the Spirit and the bride say come. He takes the death for every man. Not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Now, it's, that does not lead itself to universalism because we understand that God offers pardon by two conditions. What are the two conditions? Repentance and faith. Exactly how Jesus started his ministry. Repent and believe the gospel. God offers pardon by two conditions. Repentance and faith. But the atonement made salvation available to all. It made it available. But very important. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. So in the end of like Thessalonians and Jude and like Paul's epistles where he says not to him who's able to keep you from stumbling. Sure. Is that in relation to the act of cleansing? So the question was does the atonement of Jesus Christ basically keep us on autopilot to where we can't stumble or we can't sin? Now there were People within the Orthodox Christian community who taught this and that they are labeled. Uh, I don't want to label them. I don't like what people label me, but people I, I genuinely respect. I don't think that's what that's referring to. This is my personal opinion. Everything study yourself. But I, I do believe. We should never treat the blood as common. Uh, Hebrews talks about tre tre treading underfoot the blood. You know, the, the new covenant is sacred and holy. It, it made us new with new heart. We never, we never want uh, to go back. We're to press onward. We're, you know, Jesus is looking on to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're, we're to go to him. He's, he's, the, new, the, the, he's the, the new way. We're, not, we're, we're to be dead to our old ways and our old lifestyles. So it does lead us. The blood speaks a better word than of Abel, the Bible says. We're not to go back to the, to the old way of trying to do things ourselves or trying to earn it. We need to know that Jesus has provided a... And we're regenerated on the inside. And so we walk this new way. Not, not in our old mindsets. But we have a new mind. Which is the mind of Christ. So. If a believer sins. He has an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Now not when. And we should never trample underfoot the blood of the new covenant. We should never uh, turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Which means a license to sin. You know, we should be joyfully holy because the blood has cleansed us and set us free and ransomed us and should lead us to a life of joyful service, not grudging, you know, I, I, joyful service. Now, remember, it's not a have to, it's a want to. It's a, it's a, it's a want to. And be wary of people who are always trying to do the minimum. That's not it. That's not, that's not Christianity. Christianity is not just keeping your head above water. Making it. No. It's so much more. There's such a grace and, an, and an, uh, a life overflowing of gratitude and joy in what Jesus has done in me. 
I'm a new person. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. I never want to think those thoughts or go that way or live selfish. I want to live his way. You know, that's what he says. The servant shall be like his master. That's what I want. I want to be like him, talk like him, act like him. And that's the whole point. That we can have relationship together through the atonement. But you're on to something where some people use their view of the atonement to unfortunately try to live lives that are un unbecoming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's not us. That's not us. Because we love him. And our hearts are filled with love. As Paul says, the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. As Peter says, forgetting the things that were behind. Those former things. Former sins. When Peter describes sins for the believer, you know what he always describes them in the what tense? Past sins. We're to live victorious, joyful, holy lives now. Because of what he did. And so many people look at the atonement as a covering. And not a cleansing. Not the source of a completely new life. What Jesus did was not a patch job. It's not a Jesus jacket where God Almighty can't see you anymore. No, friends. He that is in Christ is a new creation. A new life, new mind, new heart, new desires. The purpose of the cross that would be born again. And I met a lot of religious people who need to be born again.